And this is known as the fructification concept of interest. Now, although labor must be applied from time to time to keep the wine from turning to vinegar, to keep the pests off your crops, uh, there is, independent of the labor expended, an increase in the value of the capital. Sonia put, fixes the wine, sets it in her basement. She goes uh, on a little vacation for a couple weeks, you know, down to the beach and takes life easy. Uh, Alan plants his corn and then he's off plowing another field or maybe going to the movie. All the time that corn is growing. Now compare that to adapting hunting or, or the uh, carpentry only as the labor is applied, is value added. So the carpenter, you know, the sun comes down, the carpenter goes home. He comes back the next morning. Is that house that he's building any more valuable than it was when he left? As I make what? Yeah. Is the house that, he, that the carpenter is building any more valuable than it was when he stopped working on it? No, no. no. So it. it there it is. So what George argues is that in this first mode of production, adapting, like hunting or building houses, the primary benefit of capital is in the use of the capital, like the hammers and saws and so on, the bows and the arrows. And the primary beneficiary is the user of the capital. In the second mode of production, growing, as in farming, the primary benefit of capital is in the increase in the value of capital. And the primary beneficiary is the owner of the capital. So any labor that is necessary to affect this increase, like the person that has to weed the garden, or the person that has to take care of the chickens to make sure that they don't get cold or sick or, or so on and pick the eggs and whatever, has to be paid well, there's only one place they could be paid out, the difference between what it was worth when you first borrowed it and what it's worth when you exchange it, right? Out of the increase. And they're certainly going to have to be paid as much as they could have produced if they'd gone over and been a carpenter or a hunter and adapted means to end. And if anybody wants to borrow a capital, to build a house, they want to borrow the tools and machinery or even the materials, aren't they going to have to pay the person they borrow it from as much as their capital would have increased if they had maintained it in the form of that was capable of increase, like the crop or the wine or something that was going to have a natural increase in value? The sheep, the bees, etc. The trees, maybe, is a, a pretty. Uh, straightforward where there's not a lot of complication with the trees that grow. Now, if we're saying that the interest is the increase of capital, which of these increases faster? On average. <laughs> so why would anybody invest in rabbit uh, in horses when they could invest in rabbits and get a much bigger increase? So what happens to the value of rabbits as people start investing in rabbits? Well, if there are too many rabbits, the price goes down. Well, that's exactly our point. <laughs> and as people stop investing in horses, the price goes up, and, and people will continue to invest in rabbits until the return on rabbits and horses seeks that equilibrium where there's, there's no greater reward for investing in rabbits and horses. Now, I guess I'm allowed to, to disagree with Henry George a little bit. Transportation and trade. And he believes that the increase in the value of things from trade can be attributed to nature. Therefore, he thinks it is similar to the increase in the value of things that grow. I mean, let's face it, when we trade, things get more valuable, don't they? They grow oranges in Florida, they grow apples in New York, 
and we trade, and now the people in Florida get oranges and apples cheaper than they would otherwise. Yeah. Right? And vice versa. So trading is, without a doubt, the most efficient or the thing that increases the value of our labor more than anything else. Trade. And probably it's the, the evidence I would support is if you look at the markup on an item in a store, around 100%, isn't it? So trade is, is pretty powerful stuff. But I would argue that the oranges increase in value as labor moves them to the place where they're scarce. If you got them halfway to New York from Florida, about let's say about Virginia, they'd be worth more than they were in Florida. I mean, they haven't been exchanged yet. And the closer they get to New York City, the more valuable they are. And the apples, the same thing, right? So I would argue that, that it isn't the exchange, but the labor that's exerted in moving them to the place where they're scarce that actually increases the value. But, um, and also the place where they're moving to changes the value. That's the point, yes. I mean, if, if we were to move oranges from uh, Florida to Southern California, it would cost a lot to do it, but they wouldn't be worth it. <coughs> or maybe you know, oranges, Florida oranges taste better than California oranges, but not much. You know? So, yes, I agree. I'm thankful for that. Um, nonetheless, I would argue uh, that even though I can't agree, and this is a, a thing that's been going around the Georgia's movement for as long as I've been there, and, and probably long before I ever heard of Henry George, they've been arguing it. But if we took a windmill, a windmill's a lot like wine. All the time I'm making the wine, all the time I'm building the windmill, all I'm doing is producing something with my labor. Once that thing's up and spinning, I go to on vacation. The electric is coming right through that wire, day in, day out. I no labor is needed. So that is why I think we're willing to pay interest. If I, if I give you a windmill, lend you a windmill ready to go, you can start contracting that electric right there with no labor needed until some maintenance is required. But you get a, a coasting period, shall I say. Solar collector, same idea. So you're not harnessing the reproductive forces of nature, you're harnessing the productive forces of nature. There's an element of time, the long, more, more time that that solar collector is in use, in action, the more electric it produces. Now, here is Sarah, and she goes and up in the attic and finds her grandmother's memoirs and takes a long time to cipher what they mean, and she figures it out with great confidence after long uh, effort. And she types it up, and she says to, to Sonia, hey, uh, I just got this typed up. Would you like a copy? How long did it take to double what she's produced? A minute? Right? So she can make two copies in it. The first copy took three months. The second copy took three, three minutes. And when it gets in the copy machine, it takes three seconds. So here's an example where once the capital is produced, you never have to repeat the steps that were originally necessary. And you can just keep making copy after copy. But if that every existing copy is lost, you've got to go back to the manuscript and start over. Wouldn't people pay for the advantage of time and not having to repeat? steps that were originally necessary? How about the steel mill? We have a, a, a nuclear holy smoke, you know, in uh, World War IV, and every steel mill in the world is destroyed. Does that mean we'll never have steel again? But it certainly means we're going to have to start producing it in a much less efficient way until we get a steel mill built. And if somebody lends you a steel mill ready to go, wouldn't you be willing to pay interest? So any of these things which give us an advantage of time, 
I think are completely consistent with this idea of Henry George. That that interest is not based on the greater result, but on an advantage of time and having the concrete results of so much labor. And my final argument here is that I go to Rita and I say, Rita, you have an accounting and, and uh, bookkeeping business, and I'm going to lend you $1,000 worth of computer uh, equipment, and we both agree that you're the results of your labor now with the computer, the printer, the modem, all of the, this equipment will triple the results of your labor. And all I'm asking is that you give me two-thirds of all your income. And what would she say? No. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> well, why not? I triple the results of your labor. Because... Yeah, price is too high. Yeah, price is too high because guess what Henry George is saying? Interest isn't for the increase in the power of the tool, it's the advantage of time. Now, to try and come back to this idea of this equilibrium between the return, rewards to labor and the rewards to capital, we have a farmer. And of course the farmer has seed and fertilizer and a barn and a tractor and plow and uh, equipment. And let's say it's worth $100,000. And down the road, also on free land, at this, what we call the margin, is a sawyer. And he has a big sawmill and uh, a skidder that carries, drags the logs around and so on. And his capital is also worth $100,000. And he, too, is on free land. And we notice that uh, both families who are working equally hard and equally long each day enjoy approximately the same standard of living. But as time goes on, we notice that the farmer is enjoying a significantly higher standard of living than the sawyer. And so time goes by and the children of the sawyer are about to start their own family. And the question is, are they going to start a sawmill or a farm? So far. Because farmers live better. Man seeks to satisfy his desires with the least he deserves. And so we, we uh, the family, the new family starts to farm and they start growing food. And what happens to the supply of food in the community? Increases. And as the supply, all of the things being equal, the supply of food goes up. What happens to the value of food? No. Down. And the standard of living of farmers? <laughs> Down. Started to fall, doesn't it? Well, now the children of the farmer are about to uh, start a family, and they're thinking, do we start a farm or a sawmill? <laughs> well, as it turns out, of course, there's one more family demanding boards now, and there's the same number of boards for sale as before. The value of boards were going up. The Sawyer's family starts to enjoy a higher standard of living, right? And so it brings it back into equal. So, I know, I'm not sure if I said this, but I wanted to say this. In the case of the farmer, his efforts, all his capital is trying to affect an increase of capital, right? The crop that grows. No, no doubt the tractor's going to be worn, the barn might need paint, the weed seed and fertilizer, but the crop's going to be worth far more than the, than the depreciation of his capital. So, all of his efforts goes into affecting the increase of capital. On the other hand, the Sawyer is changing logs into boards, and all his efforts are to adapt, to um, change matter in form or in place, to make boards out of logs. And so what George says is their division tends to make the rewards of labor and capital equally attractive. Will give an equivalent, an equal result to either for an equivalent effort or sacrifice made. That is to say, wages tend to an equilibrium. Now, I have always, all these years, said, you know, I know what he, I kind of know what he means, but so I tried to reword it. Capital used for adapting enhances wages. Capital used for growing yields an increase. The capital increases in value. No one 
will pursue wages if they can get a higher reward from an increase in capital. Therefore, wages and interest tend. I am thrilled that you've gone like this because that is a hard one. Yeah, that summarizes basically uh, one of the points. That was so hard. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I read everything you had to say since last week again. <laughs> I thought about it some more. Um, it's still really hard, hard for me. So it's near impossible probably for you. <laughs> uh, 40 years I've been struggling. If interest rates go up, what happens to the demand for capital? <coughs> People are paying more to borrow capital, what happens to the demand? Yeah. When uh, interest, interest rates are it low? It goes down. Well, uh, no. If interest is low. In, in other words, uh, people who want to borrow capital are willing to pay more. So, therefore, wouldn't people start to produce more capital so that they could lend it out? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as more capital is produced, what happens to the demand for labor to produce it? It goes up. Capital is produced by labor, right? Uh -huh. So if there's a greater demand for capital because people want to borrow it, wouldn't there be a greater demand for labor to produce it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And if the supply of capital exceeds the demand, and that would be to say, that by adding more capital, you don't get a greater result. You know? yeah, then, it then it starts to go, then the rate of interest would tend to go down, and uh, less capital would be demanded, and less labor would be needed to produce, right? So what George argues is that a demand for capital is a demand for labor to produce it. That capital is sometimes called indirect labor. Uh, other economists have even said congealed labor. But his argument is that wages and interest tend to rise and fall together. We say commercial interest is for the loan of money, economic interest is for the return, is the return to capital. But of course, as I acknowledged before, money is almost always the medium by which all these things take place. If I could borrow money at a lower rate uh, of interest than I could borrow capital, I can exchange the money, here we are, read it, I can exchange the money for capital payment. So uh, the Federal Reserve, of course, lowers interest rates and we go, hey, I can borrow the money, I can go out and buy the capital. And, you, and, and that way I can get capital indirectly at a lower rate. Or if I could lease a truck or equipment for less than I can borrow the money, what am I going to do? How many times have we seen the ads on TV? We'll, we'll lease you a, a, a car for 0.9% interest. Never seen it? You guys don't have cars. You should pick another topic. But we do see it from time to time that they lease you a car or a pickup truck or something. So you can see that um, the two are inextricably linked, and obviously, whatever whoever offers the lowest rate of interest is what you're going to do: either borrow, lease the capital directly, or borrow the money and buy the capital. Either way, you're you're paying interest, and in your mind, you're really paying it for the use of that capital. Uh, it's only when we're considering society as a whole that we realize that, oh, creating money is not the same as growing food or building houses or making cars. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve, they, how do they affect the rate of interest? They sell, buy or sell um, well, I, you're, you're getting into the nuts and bolts, but I was just going to say by increasing the supply of money, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't doubt, the, and this is another one where I sat there you know, meditating on this for a long time. It might be impossible to know what the rate of interest would be if we didn't have this money that keeps being created and all the other stuff. And we only had commodity money that actually had to be produced and therefore was, was uh, capital, real capital. Um, so that makes it even more difficult to, to completely understand. But I think we could explain the different rates of interest. 
I was telling some of you uh, about a guy who goes to the payday loans and borrows 100 bucks, and they want $25 a week until he pays it back. <laughs> I don't know how many thousand percent interest that is. Uh, and of course, if you have like a collateral, you can borrow money all you all you want up to the value of the collateral for about three percent right now. Even in small amounts, I would imagine large corporations can get it even cheaper. I was trying to think of something that would be really, really high rate of return, the highest rate of return I could possibly think of. And I was thinking about deep sea treasure hunt. You know, maybe a half a million dollars worth of a large boat and aqua loans and all that stuff, and the guy comes back with ten or fifty million dollars worth of treasure. Wow. But on the other hand, how often do they come back with nothing? Most of them. More often. Way more often than not. Yes. So that's probably where you would find the highest rate of return if there was any return at all. And I was trying to think of what would be the, the most predictable thing that you could make? And I was thinking about the return on toilet paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and the difference, of course, is risk. So by George's reasoning, <clears throat> interest as a concept is not compensation for risk. The, in the aggregate, in the total, the risk is averaged out. Now, could total interest be more than the increase of capital? And I'm, I'm talking about all the benefits of this, this uh, advantage of time, like the solar collectors and so on. Could it ever be more than that? If it were, what would it be at the expense of? Wages. Wages, yeah. <laughs> and could it ever be less than the replacement of capital? No. If it was, uh, uh, would people continue to lend it out? No. No. So there it is. Now, I, I've often thought, well, people would still accumulate capital to give their labor a greater efficiency, but they certainly wouldn't lend it out. If interest were 1%, you say, well, who would, how many people would be stimulated to accumulate it and lend it out, and if it were 100%, who wouldn't be stimulated to try and save their money and, and lend it out rather than, uh, there I go again with the money, huh? that's the way we think in money, their capital, and lend it out. And where do labor and capital get everything that they produce? But, uh, what kind of land? Where they got Where they got Where they got yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the law of interest, according to Henry George, uh, interest will be the average increase of capital at the margin. And in my opinion, of course, as I said uh, ten times now, I guess, that would include all, uh, an average of all the benefits of not having to produce things in a less efficient way when it was originally necessary. Like Sarah had to, to originally uh, type up that manuscript, but not having to do that and, and so on. And I guess the, the steel mill and, and windmills and the solar collectors and all that other stuff. Now here, here's my hypothetical territory and I take these sheep, these, these sheep and I, um, Paid, which I paid ten dollars a piece for, and I let them graze for a year, and I sell them for twelve dollars. And out of the twelve dollars I take, and I pay the shepherd a dollar for every every uh, sheep, what was my rate of interest? I bought them for ten. I sold them for twelve. I paid the shepherd one. <laughs> so it's a dollar for every sheep, or ten percent. Ten percent. Now, how do we explain the difference in wages? Why does the chemical engineer make 150, 200,000 a year, and the and the uh, janitor only makes 10 or 15,000 a year? Difference in skills. There are less engineers 
No, yes, not that much in skills, you know. There's the, 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 more demand for uh, for one. Well, there's probably there's probably more demand for the janitor, but but not in the way you're meaning, of course. But at least maybe there are fewer. You were skilled. Yes. Fewer skilled. I, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have get it around. You're absolutely right, of course. Yeah, fewer uh, people with the skills to be. Uh, I was free associating on you there, sir. <laughs> but yes. The, the chemical engineer, it's a lot more difficult to learn the, the skill and, and uh, the, accumulate the knowledge and so on. And probably only a certain percentage of us are, or have the intellect to become chemical engineers where just about everybody could flip the floor. So I guess ultimately we can say supply and demand. And I'm sure that there's a few more things like the desirability of the job and things like that. So George says that the law of wages will equal the whole product less what is necessary to induce the storing up of capital where the land is free. And there is no question that is a kind of a self-evident truth, isn't it? So in that one statement, he's got the law of wages and the law of interest. The entire product less what is necessary to induce the storing up of capital. Or if you turn it around, that interest is going to be whatever it takes to induce the storing up of capital. And while George has given us a plausible explanation, all we can say for sure is that an interest will be what is necessary to induce the storing up of capital. Where land is subject to ownership and rent arises, wages will be fixed by what labor could secure from the highest natural opportunities open to it without the payment of rent. In 1849, it was reported that a baker in a San Francisco restaurant could make $500 a month. In today's dollars, that would be $14,000 a month or $70 an hour. <laughs> At the same time, the current rate of interest was 25%. I guess what today would be called the prime rate of interest. So I'm taking this right out of progress and poverty. How could that be? What, was, what were the circumstances in California in 1849? They found gold. Oh, gold! And you could go on the, uh, not far from San Francisco, a, a little a, a long walk, a little ride on a horse, I guess, and you could pay for gold. And and so in order to keep people working in San Francisco, they had to pay them, apparently, $500 a month. That also happened in Alaska because there are so few people up there who could work. And so the wages were very high, no matter what the and market. There, and there was free land. I, I don't know about that, but nevertheless, I mean, they, to get people to go up there to yeah. do whatever work it was, I mean, they had to pay very high wages. Yeah. Now, of course, it was high. I remember people saying, well, oh, yeah. oh, last you know. Oh, man. This was in the 70s. So, so the amount of labor available is a factor in what those wages will be. Um, then, when, uh, when, the easy gold was gone and the lands that contained the big deposits were fully monopolized. There was a lot more gold coming out of the ground five, ten years later. But uh, wages and interest fell back to the normal rates that were standard in the rest of the country. And interest was about 5% with no inflation. So that would be it. Now, uh, if I was doing this class, I would come back the following week with a little review. So I'm going to give you a little encore here, a little different way to do it. There's my hypothetical territory. Um, and I've got these numbers up here. So let's say that you see how it says production without the use of pre existing capital. So I go to the free land, and I first I have to either make a plow myself uh, or produce something that I can trade for one. 
before I can start farming, I've got to accumulate the capital to farm. And so, without pre-existing capital, I can produce five on the free land, five and a half on the next best grade, six and six and a half. And there it is in, in my graphic form. And if that were the case, then wages would be five on all land. Let's make it plausible a little more than five. <clears throat> Because five is what I can produce where land is free. And rent would be zero, half, one, one and a half. And now a, a young farmer comes and there's an old farmer both at the free land. And the old farmer says to the young farmer, you know, I think I'm just about shot. That's, I can't do it another bit of work. But I got a nice barn. I got every kind of a tool that you need, a plow, a team of horses. I got a whole enough seed and fertilizer for one year. Uh, I will lend you my capital if you want. And you'll pay me based upon the advantage. Well, gee, that means I could plant, plow today and plant tomorrow. And I would get in on a much longer growing season than if I had to accumulate the capital first. So, at the end of the year, instead of $5, I've produced $6 with the aid of capital. And the guy who lends me the capital, the old farmer, how much is he going to get? What? He says, because of my existing capital, and I lent you it, the fact that you could start producing farming today and this afternoon, one extra dollar resulted. Six was the total production instead of five. That one extra dollar belongs to me. Fair enough? And of course, the land, there's nothing for the landowner, the land is all free. But this guy over here wants to make him the same offer. Lend me your capital. I could start farming on my superior land today, and it turns out that the superior land will yield one and a half dollars at the end of the year, instead of just one. And so the capitalist, the old man who lends him the capital, says, give me one dollar and fifty cents. That's what my capital uh, gave him. And what does the landowner say? Without your capital, I can make uh, five, right? Well, without the capital on this land, mm -hmm. he could have made five and a half. Okay. But with the capital, because it's superior land, it, right. it's much more fertile, mm -hmm. it will grow one and a half. Where the land is free, it only would yield one more at the end of the year, but on the superior land, it would yield one and a half. And so the capitalist says, I want the one and a half. What's the landowner say to him? Well, the way you set it up, he's going to get five and a half, have five and a half left over if he pays the whole one and a half. Yeah, but would he pay better than he does on the free land? My question is, would he, would the landowner be willing to give up that one and a half? He wouldn't. I would not if I was. Uh, What's his alternative? Well, the free land would give you basically the same thing, right? No. Free land gives him five to... Well, wait, we're talking about the capitalist now. So, uh -huh. so let's stay in this line. If, okay. if he puts the capital to work down here on the free land, uh -huh. it'll yield one. Okay. If he puts it to the land that's already owned by somebody and is superior, it will yield one and a half. And, and can he claim that one and a half? What's the landowner going to say to him? And I thought, my ears are so bad, but I thought you said it already. Okay. I'm not sure, I just wasn't sure. What I said was the difference. He, there is really no incentive to, to give it up because if he could go to the free land, he would, he would probably make the same thing. If he could go to the free land, for sure he could get the one. Yeah. Now, the only reason he's getting the one and a half is because the land is more fertile. Yes. So the landowner is going to say, if you don't like me giving you a little bit more than one, go down there and get one. Yeah. The only reason that 
It's one and a half is because my land is superior. This has nothing to do with your capital. It has to do with my land, right? Isn't that the law of rent? says, take one. And I suppose, you know, I've never figured out exactly how to say this in the class. Probably the reality is somehow that, that the higgling of the market, the bidding of, of people who want to use the capital is going to, the one who can use it most efficiently is going to outbid the others. But I think for the sake of this chart, I don't have to say a little more than to make it plausible, but maybe I should say that. I don't know how, how to make it most plausible, but Basically, he's going to get one because that's what he can produce where the land was greater. Or that's the what the the uh, increase of his capital would be, uh, in the words of George, where the land is great. And the superior amount goes to the owner of the land. And if it was on the more fertile land, it would yield two dollars a year. He would give the capitalist one, and he would get one. And two and a half, he would get one, and, and uh, so on. So basically, the law of interest and the law of rent are the same law. Labor and capital get everything they can produce where the land is free, and the landowner gets the surplus, everything above and beyond. And so I just added these up to, and to make the total wealth of 9876. <coughs> Wages and interest are six six six, and the rent is three two one, and three land yields no rent. Wages, interest, rent determined by the margin and account for the full division of the profit. Wages and interest are on one side, landowners are on the other side. 